Hello dear viewers, this is Ubuntu. We have a special edition today. Uh, we'll be focusing on the war in Ukraine and also uh, on the current situations in Ethiopia. Uh, me and my colleague Munir Abdelmenan, uh, we are at uh, the residence of uh, the German ambassador, His Excellency Ambassador Stefan Auer. Uh, we are very glad to have you as our guest. Well, thank you very much for welcoming me to your channel and to me here. Um, looking forward to our discussions. Yeah. So to introduce you to our viewers, uh, Ambassador Stefan Auer is a lawyer by training. He is a career diplomat and he was uh, in Seoul, Korea before he came to Ethiopia. He is now uh, an ambassador for both the AU and the Ethiopia. Please tune with us and uh, let's continue. Uh, thank you again, Ambassador, for being our guest. Uh, I'll directly go to the first question. Uh, Many people suggest that the reason behind the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is the expansion of the NATO to the former Soviet Union countries. As a member state of NATO, what's your take on these suggestions? Well, what we see is a flagrant violation of international law and the international order. Russia has attacked a sovereign neighboring state, which is weaker and has uh, violated the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. This is a, a position which not only Germany holds, but 141 states of the United Nations as well. Back in the 2nd of March, uh, these 141 nations have uh, condemned the Russian aggression on Ukraine. So this is not a, how shall I say, a a war or a conflict between Russia on the one hand and the West or NATO on the other hand. This is an attack of Russia against the international order. And this is why we have to jointly stand together to defend this international order and to condemn this Russian aggression unanimously. I think this is very important. The fact that also the ICG, the International, international Court of Justice on 16th of March has ordered Russia to end this aggression clearly demonstrates that the international law is very clear on this, namely that this is an aggression aggression. Still, Russia has decided to continue with its aggression. The consequences are really catastrophic for the Ukrainians themselves. There's a huge humanitarian crisis developing there. We already now have a lot of destruction of civilian infrastructure. Thousands of civilians have been killed. And also we see a lot of IDPs and refugees fleeing the Russian attacks. We have, according to United Nations, 4.9 million refugees who have already uh, are internally displaced. Over 3 million have fled to the EU member states or to Moldavia. 200, over 200,000 only to Germany, just to give you some figures of the, the extent of this devastation which is taking place. But this is not only, and this is what I would like to underline to our African viewers, this is not only a war which affects Europe, it has a direct impact on Africa itself. We see it now in the rising wheat prices, oil prices and corn prices. But it will also affect the limited resources we have at our disposal. They will also need to address the needs in Ukraine and they are growing constantly. So with the Russian attack on the breadbasket of the world, which is Ukraine, they produce, I can give you some figures, around about 30% of the world's wheat exports, 20% of the maize export, and 50% of the edible oil. With that attack of the Russian of the Russians on the Ukraine, you cannot export these goods anymore. You prohibit that crops are being exported, that they're produced. And this has, of course, a very negative effect on the food security and the food supply chains in the world. So this will affect all of us. So this is why I think that, and I would like to reiterate, that Germany is very much committed to finding peaceful solutions. We are and we are still committed to providing humanitarian assistance to the people affected. I think this is very important to underline. But I think in order to be able to stop this aggression, to stop the humanitarian crisis, and to stop 
this food insecurity in the world unfolding, we need to unanimously condemn uh, this Russian aggression. We need to stand by the Ukrainian people. We need to stand to the international order. We need to stand to the United Nations Charter and also by the United Nations Secretary General Guterres. So according to you, the suggestion that the, one of the reasons of the war is the NATO's expansion is baseless. Totally baseless. Totally baseless. You know, NATO is a collective self-defense organization of democracies. It has never launched an attack. You have to grant every country its own right to decide which organization they want to belong to. All African states, most of them, have also the right to do so. For instance, they have decided to join the African Union. You cannot defend them to join, to uh, forbid them to, def to, to join the African Union. Same applies to countries in Europe. They choose to join the EU. They choose to join NATO. So why shouldn't we respect their right for self-determination? The whole concept of NATO's expansion, you can only see it as a way of enabling these countries to determine their, their, themselves to which organization they would like to belong. And this is not a threat to any country because it, it, it secures peace and stability in Europe. But of course, if you have the perspective from Russia and you, you, you have this entry point, which means that you have a colonialist, revisionist, expansionist policy, if you put this at the basis of your security policy, then of course an expansion of, a, of a other military alliance to your borders may seem as a threat, but this is not our security strategy. We are peaceful, democratically elected governments who have chosen to join a military collective security defense alliance. I have a follow-up question here. Uh, why wasn't the Ukraine allowed to join uh, the NATO and also the EU? The EU? Yeah. Well, this is a very long process, you know. I mean, if, if NATO is an um, like, uh, uh, alignment of uh, democracies, why wasn't Ukraine allowed to join? What was the rationale behind uh, the delay of Ukraine joining the NATO in the EU? Well, you know, you have to... Um, follow a very long process in which different criteria are being evaluated, whether you qualify to join NATO. I have been working in the EU, so I know the process very well on how uh, to join the EU, and you have to meet certain criteria. They are very, very uh, elaborate, and um, you need to see whether the applying country fulfills this criteria. And this is being evaluated, and if they don't fulfill this criteria, which of course takes a lot of time, then um, we help them fulfill these criteria. And at the end of this process, there is then finally the adherence to an organization. I don't know how long it took, but it took very, very long for Croatia, for instance, to join the EU. So this is nothing you can do overnight. So this is a process which took Long, which takes long time until you join an organization. So it was not the fear of Russia? It, let us put it that way. This is also something way which you have to take into consideration. We don't want to alienate people. We want to, inc to have an inclusive uh, dialogue with all partners. And Russia up to now, we always reached out to Russia. There's the possibility for Russia also to discuss with, our thing, with, our, with NATO, even NATO, um, Problems, security problems, they perceive as security problems. This is why the NATO-Russia Council has been created, to enable Russia to address their security concerns. So in one of his speeches, uh, President Zelensky said that Ukraine was left alone. Uh, they didn't get the help they expected or they needed from the NATO. So what do you think is the reason of the NATO's inaction? Is it a fear from the Russia's uh, responses or is it just a strategy? Well, as I said, NATO is a 
an organization of collective security um, in which its members um, organize themselves to defend themselves against external threats or attacks. This is the famous Article 5. But this only applies to member states of NATO. Ukraine, as we have just um, said, is not a member state of, Ukraine, of NATO. So this is why this Article 5 um, didn't apply to Ukraine. But together with the G7, together with the EU, NATO is coordinating also with Ukraine to see how we can best help Ukraine in its defense. We have adopted vast sanctions against President Putin and his system and his oligarchs. Um, this is unparalleled up to now. Not against the Russian people, but against the Putin and his system so that he cannot finance this war any further. And we also help, of course, Ukraine with the delivery of items which help them defend themselves. Uh, earlier in your response, you said that Russia waged a war against the world order. So uh, a lot of agreements have been uh, violated these days, like the Budapest Agreement, the Minsk Agreement. We, we can count uh, so, too many agreements, you know. Uh, do you think there is a power balance shift from the West to, to the East? Is a new world order in the making? Do you say like that? I don't hope so. I really hope that we can um, defend the present world order. Why? Because it's rules-based, it protects the weak against the strong, uh, and we have to jointly um, defend this world order so that it is not replaced by an order where only military might counts. This is something which is very important also to African countries. And this is why also territorial integrity and um, sovereignty are enshrined in the AU Charter. These are the guiding principles of the African integration because they guarantee peace and security. And we need to defend that jointly. And, you know, a month after the EU-AU summit we've had in Brussels, um, we sort of adopted a joint vision um, for 2030 based on common values. This implies that Europe's future depends very much on Africa's future and developments in Africa, but the same also applies to Africa. What happens in Europe will affect Africa's future. So we have a common interest in defending these values, these principles, against the attacks of one president who thinks that he can roll back history to the Soviet times. Uh, there are claims that uh, the EU does not uh, wish well for Africans, you know, uh, and the Russians also uh, likes to claim this kind of claims, you know. We haven't participated in colonialism, and we are not uh, exploiting Africa, this and this. So, uh, why, why would Africans have to believe you? I mean, what are you offering for Africa? Well, I think uh, what we are offering in the West to Africa, this is, I think, abundantly clear. We are the biggest partner of the AU. The EU is the biggest institutional partner by the, to, to the AU. We, Germany, are the biggest bilateral partner uh, to the African Union. Uh, we know, and as I said, that our common future depends very much on a prosperous, democratic, and peaceful Africa, as your future also depends on a prosperous, peaceful, and democratic Europe. So we need to stand together and to help each other. But if you want to really build up this country, you need economic cooperation, you need development cooperation, you need assistance, you need cooperation. I think that is extremely important. So, as you said it very clearly, the general impact of the war will affect Africa and the whole world in general. Uh, so, the development partners like Germany, uh, like you said, you have plans for Africa to work together to avert the effects of the war together, but 
do, do you have a clear plan on how to avert the effects of the war, the immediate effects? Well, we are working um, with international organizations to see how we can mitigate the impact um, on the rising prices of food and oil. Just to give you an example, we have also uh, released um, the oil reserves in order to, to lower the oil price to increase the supply size so that the demand is met and that would have an effect on the lowering of the prices. So this is what we are doing amongst other things, of course. But I think we need to be very clear and unified so that this war comes to an end as quickly as possible. Because only then uh, you will have these effects, you will avoid these effects. Um, this is our common interest. Do you you see have to address, just, just let me, you yeah. have to address the root causes, you know, of, of, of these food insecurity and, and the, 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 the problems for the food supply chain. And that is the root cause is Russia's attack on Ukraine. Do you see hopes to end the war in recent times? Well, you should never give up hope, as we say in German. But um, this presupposes, of course, that the Russian side is really genuine when it comes to the negotiating table, that there is really a genuine interest on the Russian side to stop this war. So uh, you're repeatedly saying that Africans and um, every country in the world should, should stand together and uh, should, be, should uh, denounce the invasion in the war. Uh, recently, uh, Ethiopia was uh, absent at the UN General Assembly. So do you think that was a wise decision? What would you do if you were uh, in, in Ethiopia's place? <laughs> well, um, I don't want to comment on Ethiopia's decision. Um, they have taken it surely after thorough consideration, deliberations within the government. I don't make a secret out of my hope or of my wish that I would have ha liked to have a more firm position of the Ethiopian government. But as I said, this is for Ethiopia to decide. We respect it, of course. Um, let me generally just once again say that this, this is a very historic moment we are witnessing at the moment. The international order is at stake. And in particular, those countries who do not belong to the superpowers, like European countries, like African countries, have an interest in defending this order because it protects the weak and the poor against the strong, against those who think that they can, you know, um, press their interest onto the weak ones. So I think we all have this interest in defending it. We have to, an interest to stop this war as soon as possible so that the negative impacts do not affect more the people in Ukraine, but above that also the people worldwide, also in Africa. Yeah, but uh, countries has been like, invaded uh, for centuries, you know. Uh, over the past decade, several countries have been invaded and some even were um, totally uh, destroyed, like Syria, like Libya, Iraq. Uh, why is it now again the, the world order, you know? Is it because uh, the war is against European country? No, you, can't, you, cannot, um, you cannot compare it. We have here the aggression of one state against another sovereign state. The other countries have not been invaded and that Syria has not been invaded. It, has, it was a civil war within Syria which uh, was waged. And you see that also in Libya. It wasn't invaded by a foreign power or by a neighboring country. You cannot see that. This is not comparable. You see here a flagrant violation of the international order, namely of the principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty of a neighboring state. But Iraq was invaded, I think. Iraq? Do you beg to agree? It was Kuwait which was invaded by Iraq and then there was an alliance of different countries who, you know, you know, pushed back the Iraqis army back to, to, to Iraq. So you don't think uh, the concern is a bit um, out of proportion? No, I don't think so, because the, um, the, the, the liberation of Kuwait um, was based on uh, international law. 
it was according to international norms and regulations, while as this here is a flagrant violation of the United Na Nations resolutions and uh, order. So you cannot compare it. And this has been clearly also said by the ICG I just mentioned, you know, the International Court of Justice on the 16th of March really stated that this aggression has to stop. It's not justifiable. In recent Facebook posts from the Russian embassy in Addis, in Ethiopia, they said uh, Russia is fighting Nazism and your embassy also responded in the same platform. So is Russia fighting Nazism? I'm giving you a chance to elaborate what your embassy responded on the Facebook post. Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, I know this um, narrative, I know it, and uh, I think it's very cynical and um, it is ridiculous. You know, Ukraine is a democracy. It has an elected leader, as a parliament, and this is perhaps something which is disturbing Russia, that they have a vibrant democracy on their doorsteps. The Council of Europe, the OSCE, the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights have established that there is no persecution of Russian-speaking citizens, of Rus or ethnic Russian citizens in eastern Ukraine. This is a totally fabricated narrative in order to galvanize domestic support for a war which is not justifiable. The, Ukraine, the, the Russian state-controlled media are trying to vilify, vilify Ukraine in order to justify their acts against this democratically elected country and government. So okay. I think this is fabricated and a clear disinformation campaign. And also the United Nations Secretary General Guterres on the 22nd of February, I think, he said that there is no genocide going on in Ukraine. So if um, the invasion continues, uh, what's going to be uh, the action of NATO, Germany, and the superpowers? What, the, what do you think uh, they should do? I mean, but that's very difficult to predict, and this is something for the do you heads think of the sanctions are enough. Well, um, I think the sanctions uh, will hit the Russian economy very hard, and also, in particular, the oligarchs. Um, as I said, they are unparalleled, and they have the aim to stop uh, the flow of money with which um, the Russian system is financing this war. Um, whether there are enough, we'll see. Time will see, but I'm confident that um, they will have an impact. They already have an impact now. Um, we have to be careful that this doesn't escalate into something which could become a third world war. So we need to be very careful uh, when we uh, analyze further steps. But this is a decision which is taken by the heads of state of government. But at the end of the day, let me reiterate that. This war depends solely on President Putin's decision. He has started the war, so he has to end the war as well. And at the end of any war, there's always a solution. There's always a political solution or agreement. And the better, and for the sake of everybody, including the Russians, it is better to have it as soon and as quickly as possible. Uh, well. Some people uh, claim that Rus uh, Russian business owners, celebrities and the likes for in different world countries are being profiled by for just being Russian. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, as I said, what uh, the sanctions are aiming at is not uh, to profile certain people. We want to hit the system of uh, uh, President Putin uh, in order to enable, not to enable him to finance uh, this war of aggression against Ukraine. This is the purpose uh, and objective of, this, of these sanctions. Uh, I have another question. Recently, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia issued a statement on, uh, uh, on the Ukraine war, mm -hmm. and the statements call for uh, de-escalation. So how, how does your government take the statement? How did you get it? 
Well, of course, we welcome that also the Prime Minister is very much in favour of a political dialogue, which we also would like to see. Um, this is very important. Um, at the end of the day, as I said, we need a political solution um, to a conflict which cannot be won militarily. Even if Russia succeeds to, to occupy the whole of Ukraine, which up to now we cannot see, um, at the end of the day we need a political solution for a sustainable peace. Um, so this is why I, I think uh, the pres pr statement of the Prime Minister is very wise in asking for a political solution and political dialogue. I think you have said a lot about the impact of the war on uh, developing countries like Ethiopia, but I want you to elaborate even more so that our viewers can understand what the real impact of the war is. Well, as, as I said already, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. Um, they are producing 20% um, of the wheat, 30% of the corn, or I don't know, or the other way around, I don't know, but I just didn't mention that they are very... Um, important producer <coughs> of wheat and corn. And as I said, half of the world's little bit of oil is produced in Ukraine. So let's just like, just take, let's take this. Um, if you take this and you see that through the Russian attack and invasion of Ukraine, you cannot produce the crops anymore. You cannot export the crops and the products derived from the crops. This necessarily will have an impact on the prices of wheat and oil, eatable oil, they already now skyrocketing. So we have an interest in enabling Ukraine to be able to produce the crops and hopefully to be able to export the eatable oil again. I think that is very important because this is a simple equation. If you reduce the supply side and the demand stays the same, prices skyrocket. So you have to increase the supply side again by enabling Ukraine the breadbasket to export and produce their crops. Okay, let's talk about Ethiopia. As we all know, Ethiopia is in civil war. There is war going on in several parts of Ethiopia. So, what did Germany do to force a ceasefire in Ethiopia? Well, we, 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 we don't force a ceasefire. Um, we are talking to the Ethiopian government. Uh, in our outreach, we are um, thinking that and saying that um, we, uh, there is no military solution to this problem. We need to have a political solution, as we have uh, also been um, championing when it comes to the Russian aggression on Ukraine. So we need a political solution to a conflict um, which has been dragging on for a long time and which has had very negative effects on the whole of North Ethiopia, not only Tigray, but also the, the neighboring regions. So um, we need to find a way to declare a cessation of hostilities as a first step so that we get to this political process, to this political dialogue, which is so important to address the root causes of the problem. Uh, please tell us about the humanitarian assistance your country is doing to the war affected areas. Well, we have increased considerably our humanitarian assistance. Um, we are now the third biggest humanitarian uh, provider um, to, to Ethiopia, but not only to, to the northern regions, to the whole of Ethiopia. And this is very important to underline, because it's not only about North Ethiopia or about Tigray. We have a lot of needs there. It's very, very severe there, the needs which are there. But there are also, as I said, in Afar and in Amhara region, but also in other places of, of Ethiopia. So one, couldn't, one shouldn't single out a region. This applies to the whole of Ethiopia where we provide humanitarian assistance. So uh, the war broke out in Ethiopia during the US election. So many uh, people were, were expecting uh, Germany to fill in the shoes of the US and to lobby the government to stop the war, the government, and also uh, from this grand side to put pressure on both sides. But uh, I, I haven't seen that. Do you think Germany did enough for Ethiopia? Well, in my view, we did what we could. Um, we spoke to the Ethiopian government, as I said. We are saying to them that uh, we would like to continue our partnership. You know, we have had, we consider Ethiopia to be 
of utmost importance for the stability of the Horn of Africa. We have a big interest in the stability of Ethiopia and therefore also in the reform process which has been undertaken um, by this government and uh, we very much support the economic and political reforms. Why? Because I think it can contribute if they are implemented and continued successfully to the stability and democratization of this wonderful country. Uh, and this could also serve as a role model for other countries, not only in Africa, worldwide. You know, the transformation of a, of a state-driven economy to a free market economy. This is, this is something which creates jobs. Um, so we have been supporting that very much. And we've been telling our friends here in the Ethiopian government that we would like to continue that support. But that, of course, presupposes that we have peace in this country because you can only have sustainable economic and political reforms if you have peace. And in order to have peace, you have to address the root causes of the conflicts. And um, this is the national dialogue, which is, you know, have, has been launched. And we hope that this national dialogue will then lead to, um, uh, to, this, to sustainable solutions to the root causes this country is facing since decades. Do you think the process of the national dialogue is on track? Do you think the process is legitimate enough to bring all the stakeholders on board? Well, it's very difficult for me to, to say that. I mean, it's just been launched, so I've heard the criticism about it. Uh, so it's a bit too early for me to say anything, and it's up to the Ethiopians to decide. It's not for me to, to say. Um, but in general, I think what we can say is that um, there have been very successful national dialogues worldwide in different countries and they are um, very good in order to address the root causes. But that presupposes, of course, that this national dialogue is credible, that it is all-inclusive, that everybody feels himself represented in this, in this national dialogue. Um, I think that would be very important, um, that national dialogue is credible and that it can address all root causes of a conflict in general. I'm sure you have the information that uh, some major oppositions have already pulled out uh, of the national dialogue uh, process. So is there any advice for the oppositions and also for the government so that an uninclusive uh, dialogue happens? Well, it's not for me to give any advice. I'm just saying that I think it is very important for the credibility of national dialogue that it is all inclusive and addresses all the root causes. Of, of, of a conflict. I think that is very important that everybody of the almost 120 million Ethiopians feel represented in this national dialogue. Will Germany help this national dialogue process financially? And if you are, if you are going to help uh, the, the process financially, what are going to be your requirements? I mean, like. Well, we have been uh, helping and assisting very much already the NEBE, the National Election Board of Ethiopia and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission because we think these are very important uh, independent organizations which need to be strengthened. Uh, whether we will um, also support uh, the National Dialogue Commission depends very much on how it develops. It's too early to say, but if things progress well and we have this uh, all-inclusive National Dialogue, I can well imagine that we will also support this. So there is a precondition. No, we, it's just too, too early to say. We have first to see, and uh, then we'll see. Ambassador, we would like to give you the chance to cover anything if you think we're left. Let me just say from the bottom of my heart that I wish this country uh, to find peace, um, that uh, you address all these questions uh, which have up to now led to a to conflicts in this country. This is such a beautiful country of such a huge potential and um, so vibrant, intelligent people um, that uh, I really wish you to um, develop into a prosperous, democratic country you deserve. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you very much for having me.